All right. Praise the Lord. We are in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That's where you need to turn this evening. Uh, we're picking up in the midst of something we started or we're in the midst of doing last week and uh, trying to uh, move it through to the conclusion and then uh, move on down into the next section. I'm going to start reading tonight at the familiar place from last week, uh, starting with verse number 13, verse number 13 in chapter 4. This is what it says there in the New International Version of the Bible. Brothers and sisters, we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of them, uh, like the rest of mankind who have no hope. For we believe Jesus died and rose again, and so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive who are left remaining, or left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not uh, precede those who have fallen asleep. The Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command and with the voice of the archangel and, excuse me, and with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. All right, uh, we started dealing with some of this uh, material last time that we were together, and so uh, let's see what we can do to, to uh, continue along and, and uh, get this done. Now, uh, uh, we have been talking about how this relates in, in a matter of speaking, uh, particularly with 1 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, what, do, uh, what do we have to say tonight? Well, uh, I want to start tonight dealing with uh, just a little bit of uh, stuff in this very first verse, in, uh, in uh, verse number 13, and, and then move through verse by verse. Uh, uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about in verse number 13 is this last phrase where it says, who have no hope, uh, who have no hope. Uh, this word hope... Uh, it's basically elpis in the in the Greek it means hope. Uh, very solid translation of of this word, uh, and it uh, it means something that's a little bit uh, perhaps different than than we normally would would maybe think of the word hope. For instance, when I say, "What do you hope for?" What's your concept of hope, anyone? What, is, what do you think of when you hear the word hope? What does that mean? How, how, how would you uh, uh, look at something that you hope for? What, what's, uh, what's, the, what's the gist of that? Something you'd like to see happen. Something you might hope to have someday. Okay, uh, so it's an aspirational thing. Anticipation. Okay, something that's not here yet. Otherwise, you wouldn't be hoping, right? So it's coming up. Okay, that's a very practical way to wrap up what it means to have hope. You, 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 rather than uh, than the lack of hope, I guess. Anything else? You, you, you're bringing out some of the things that I think are important for us because when we hear the word hope, that's, these are exactly the kind of things that we think, right? Um, and one thing I would say about that is that notice how in all that we've been talking about, no one used the word certainty. And that's the difference between this word and what we commonly, you know, in our English speaking, when we use the word hope, what we mean by hope. That's the difference between that and, and this Greek word, elpis. Um, this Greek word is not meant to convey uncertainty. It's meant to convey really the opposite. It is the anticipation of something that is sure, something that's sure to come, sure to pass. Uh, it's an expectation of what is sure. And so when we talk about biblical hope, there, there's nothing squishy about it. Nothing at all uncertain about it. When we talk about biblical hope, we are talking about something that the only reason that there's really an aspect of hope to it at all is that it hasn't happened 
yet. It's not that it won't happen. It's not that it might not happen. It most assuredly will happen. It just hasn't happened yet. And that's an important concept to have. Maybe you know. Maybe you had that in mind as you were sharing some of these things, and and uh, uh, and, if, and if so, that's great. But but from a biblical standpoint, looking at what's here in the text, I think it's important for us to understand that that's what he's talking about. So when he's talking about the world and what the world is lacking, he says that what the world is lacking, particularly in view of death, and in, particularly in view of the of thinking about loved ones, long lost, what the world lacks concerning that is any kind of certainty. They, they, just, they just don't know what to make of that. There is there's no clarity. But when we are talking about the dead in Christ, when we are talking about those of faith who have died, um, we are not people who have any reason to brook any uncertainty about that. Uh, Jesus literally, actually, physically rose from the dead, demonstrating not only that, does, that he knows how to do that kind of thing, but he said he would do that for all of us. And so our, our basis for the hope that we have concerning those who are dead is that, that in Christ all concerns and all consideration that might lead to doubt and all things that might feel like they are not uh, nailed down immovably all of those things disappear and we have this we have this certainty concerning death particularly concerning those that have died in Christ now all bets are off if you haven't died in Christ but if somebody has died in Christ do we expect to see them again Absolutely. Do we expect to see them again in freedom? And what I mean by that, running around loose in heaven. <laughs> we sure do. And boy, I tell you what, if that's something that can give you a sense of even joy in the loss of someone near and dear to you, that is really incredibly important. Now, one of the things that I think that what would you say, superstitious culture around us uh, has done with those kinds of thoughts is, is, is basically try to apply that kind of thing too broadly. And they do so uh, by basically embracing the thought that all dogs go to heaven. Right? Anyone who's lost somebody, a loved one, oh, they, they'll talk, you know, if you talk to them about the possibilities of seeing them uh, again. They'll talk about, oh yeah, we're going to get together. We're going to meet up at the bar in heaven and have a drink. Or, you know, they'll say some such like, oh yeah, we're going to go fishing when I see them, see that person. Or we're going to go, we're going to go, we're going to go make crafts when we see that, you know, this person, that person, they have different likes and interests and all those kinds of things. But there is this effort to try to find comfort in loss, in the loss of death, by by just making it all inclusive about who we actually have a reason to be hopeful concerning. And the fact of the matter is, if Christ is out of the picture, we're like the world, and there is no basis for hope. With Christ in the picture, there is no basis for uncertainty. So there's this vast difference between how the world deals with death in the grieving and the loss and that terrible feeling of separation there's such a great difference between what the world has as their experience and what we have and in a place like America in a place you know maybe even in Europe any place that's that's had a Christian influence over time they try to tap into that but there is that one proviso that makes it more than a than a one hope and turns it into this help us hope, and that is where you stand with Christ. Now that's actually mentioned in this uh, passage of Scripture, not in this first verse, but uh, as we go on, uh, it, it'll pop out uh, as we, we see here. It says, verse number uh, 14, For we believe that Jesus died and rose again, so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in Him. 
And now this is where this really brings this point to bear that that what we have concerning those who are dead and the hope that we have concerning those who are dead is all wrapped up in Christ. Number one, Christ's example, I've already mentioned that, right? He, he literally, factually, physically rose from the dead, so he knows how to do it. <laughs> Jesus knows how to get out of death. He knows how to come back from death. He knows how to do it, and he's promised to do it for us. So if this, is not, this is not an experiment. <laughs> this, is a, this is a proven remedy. Right? So we have the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, and that's uh, the foundation of all of this. But the, then he goes on to say that we also believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. Now this expression, in him, is the one that really is interesting at this point because... You know, what does that mean? You know, when I say those who have died in him. Well, I think you probably just jump to something like, well, that means those that died who have faith in Christ. Uh, those who died uh, in some regard um, connected to Christ properly. Uh, this is unusual in this phrase here, because usually if you see the word in, in English, in the New Testament, it's usually... It's usually associated with translating the, the Greek word en. But that's not the case here. En actually does mean in or within. It, you know, it has that kind of concept to it. The word used in this phrase is not this one, but it's uh, dia. Now, that is, that's a word that, that uh, should be familiar with you. Well, I know it is to you, being a mathematician for geometry, say, you know, diameter, right? Uh, maybe even diagonal. We, we see we see this this little word used as a prefix in a lot of our words. Uh, it really means through. It really means through. Uh, now it can be used in a broader sense, and I think that's the case here. That it doesn't just mean through, but it means in the sense of getting from one end to the other, from one place to the other. And so what's being talked about here is that. For those who have died, and they are, they have died uh, in the sense that they have, are going through by Jesus. They're going from one end to the other by Jesus. Those are the ones that are, uh, that, that we are anticipating returning with him. Now, that may sound like there's not a whole lot there, and there are probably is not more than that really. I mean, it says what it needs to say there on the surface pretty clearly. But the thing that I like about that is that it clearly says that it's, that it's where you're at when you die that's an issue. Why is this important? Well, you know very well that I do not believe in the doctrine that that is uh, familial Familiarly, a familiar lure that I can even say. There's a lot of syllables in there. A doctrine called once saved, always saved. And I don't hold to that. I don't even hold to that a little bit. And I don't hold to that because I can't find it in the scripture. If I could find it in the scripture, I'd hold to it. I can't find it in the scripture, so I don't hold to it. And uh, you say, well, wait a second. What are you saying? Are you saying that being born again can be undone? Uh, well, you know what, that, the answer to that is a little bit above my pay grade, but I, but I can tell you this, that if Jesus said in his letters to the churches that it's possible to erase somebody's name from the book of life, then I have to believe that it's possible for someone to have started with Christ not to end with Christ. And that's an important concept because it's not how you begin in the kingdom of God that matters, it's how you end Right? It's not the fact that you were a useless slug through most of your life. What matters is that you came to repentance through Christ and you began to trust in Him and follow after Him. That's what matters. I mean, you could be you could be Adolf Hitler if he would have repented. His beginning wouldn't have mattered. His end would have been more important. You could be some awful pedophile. What you did before 
isn't what's important. What what's important is is how you add. In the kingdom of God, this is a this is a wonderfully gracious principle. That it's it's not the failures of your past that keep you in a place or keep you from a place, but it's where you're at at the end. Where you're at at the end. And and it's really important, I think, when we look at all things uh, Christian, you know, particularly what not only what we teach, but what we try to share with people, what we try to even uh, uh, encourage uh, loved ones, family members and whatnot to follow. It's very important to understand <coughs> that nobody is going to heaven on somebody else's coattails. No one is getting into heaven on the basis of somebody else's faith. No one is going to be where they need to be with God on the basis of something that is no longer alive. It really, it really means leaving this world in a state of faith. That's what's important. If we leave this world, if we die, if we leave this world in a state of faith, what will happen? Well, if we die through Christ. We went <laughs> from one side to the other through Christ. And it means that when Christ returns, we'll come with him. Now, that's a subtle thing in there. I'm always digging for subtle things in my mind. That's a subtle thing in there, but it dawns on me that it's, it's a relatively important little thing that might be hidden there right, but right below the surface of the words, that we need, to, we need to die through Christ in order to be coming back with Christ. There's just way too many people, right, that are counting on a baptism that they did when they were 12 years old and they live like the devil the rest of their life. Way too many people that are remembering when they were 20 years old and under the, the uh, influence of a fiery preacher, they walked down an aisle, lived, you know, following Christ pretty, pretty uh, sincerely for a short time thereafter and then maybe by the time they were 35, started drifting into other things and having other interests and getting distracted by other things and you know by the time they were you know, 40 and whatever it literally wasn't all that important it wasn't that they consciously denied Christ they just kind of drifted away <laughs> you know if you believe that once saved always saved you say they're in no danger that there's no reason to warn them that there's no reason to be concerned I say forget that I'm a pastor of sheep. You know, the one thing I'm concerned about is not what might be. I'm concerned about what is. I'm not concerned about whether you might have faith. I, I'd much rather know that you do have faith. And I think that's what the Bible teaches over the course of its treatment of the subject from cover to cover. That's what it teaches. It teaches that the only way you can really know where you stand with God is in the now, and that now needs to be a place where you trust God. And if that now in which you trust God is the last now of this life, then you die through Christ, and you'll be coming back with Him when it comes. Uh, I, I know, I mean, we, we all want to feel good about ones we lost. Right? We, we've all lost people. And we want to feel good about them. We don't want to think about the negative aspects of those things. We, we don't want to deal with the broken heart, heartedness that it might cause in us. And I understand that. That's, that's very, it's very human, and I think we all experience that. But the one thing that we can't do for it is to change doctrine. Right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of things about God that, you know, we think about it, we don't know why it's that way. And uh, sometimes we don't know why it's that way when it seems like it would be so much easier for it to be some other way that's a little more palatable to us. But that's not what it is to have faith in God. Faith in God is to be so sure that He is, and so sure that you can be right with Him through Christ, that you accept what he says, you accept his teaching, and you do so even if on some aspect or in some way 
it leaves you feeling less than you would like to feel about some other instance, like for instance where great-great-grandpa might be. It doesn't matter that he was a fun guy whenever you saw him, and you have warm memories of him. What matters is whether or not when he died, he died trusting her. That's what matters. All right, I probably have beaten that more than I need to. Any questions, comments, remarks? All right, uh, so uh, dying through Christ, then he will bring those with him. Now, in saying that he brings them with him, this starts developing uh, what is going on in this thing that we call rapture. So uh, let's, uh, let's explore that. Uh, verse number 15, it says that uh, according to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. Now, what he's talking about there is the fact that there is, a, there is going to be a moment in human history when Jesus comes back. It's one of those things that in the church age, and I think I've mentioned this before, but it's one of those things in the church age that has been relegated often to the dusty spot on the bookshelf way back in the corner, you know, if we're looking at the curriculum of what we're going to teach in the church, because you know, there's just there's so much about it that's speculative. There's so much about it that seems impractical. There's so much about it that is just uh, well, let's put it this way, mysterious. And so it's just one of those subject matters that has been that that has been you know pushed aside uh, so much so that often I think that the the result of that is that Christians have almost developed a. Uh, a, a what what would say it's almost like you've been vaccinated against thinking about the reality of the coming of the Lord having some practical import in your life today. Um, again, if we look back over history, if you were alive a thousand years ago, did you have did you have a really good reason to believe in the imminent return of Christ? Well, the New Testament always told us to be watching and waiting. But as far as everything that the Bible says about this subject, no, you know, the answer would be you really, you really did. I mean, there's enough things that are put into the Bible concerning the end of time, concerning the things that will be happening in association with the end of time, and about the signs that tell you that, you're, that you are approaching the end of time. All of those things would have, uh, would have, uh, worked against thinking in terms of eminency in, in 1000 AD. Is that the same today? No, it's not really. Not only have we passed all this time, and one of the things the Bible says is, of course, that as you go on, the return of the Lord is nearer for those who are later in time than it was for those who are earlier in time. Nothing profound about that. It's just the nature of how time passes. But the thing that makes that profound is the fact that, that, the re, that the return of Christ is a biblical reality. It's not supposed to be taken as something that is mythical. It's not supposed to be taken as something that only is spiritual. It's not supposed to be taken as, as something that doesn't really have an import on our lives. Uh, we, as believers, biblical believers, need to have a conception that says this event is going to happen in real time amongst real people in this real world at some point in time. At some point in time, all of the craziness that the Bible speaks about in regards to it is going to actually happen. Skies are going to burst open. Earthquakes are going to happen. Angels are going to be uh, returning with Christ. The dead will rise. We will be transformed and raised up. Wow, all kinds of wild stuff. It's actually going to happen. It's not just a story. It's not just a spiritual tale that has some moral to it or some kind of a, uh, you know, some kind of a, an analogy uh, to life. This is a real event that's going to happen in real time at some point in time. And so, when it happens, uh, what's going on? Well, we see in this passage some of the things that we are told about here. Uh, those of us who are taking this thing very seriously. It says, according to the Lord's word, 
we who are still alive. Now, the still alive and left, you'll see the phrase, that's how the NIV translates it. A lot of English uh, Bibles translate it uh, along those same lines. Uh, the, uh, the, the concept of being left or remaining here is, is being surviving. If you wanted to talk about, for instance, a concept of, let's say, that you were walking down the street and you had some change in your pocket and you weren't really paying attention to things happening, but someplace in the midst of that walk, some of those coins bounced out, fell on the ground, and you kept on going. And then at some point in time, you, you realize, oh man, I lost, I lost, I lost my money. And you decide to, you know, to backtrack and go looking for it. And there you see that and you say, oh, there's the coin I left. And, you know, that's kind of the concept of having something left. Or like me, it's the keys. You know, you, you put them someplace, purposeful perhaps, right? But then you can't remember where you left them. <laughs> you go do something, if the, the keys stay behind, you go do something else. It's like, where did I leave those keys? I cannot find them anywhere. I've looked in the room, I've looked here, I've looked at all my, my favorite hiding spots. I cannot find my keys. You know, I left them. And we, we sometimes, I think when we see, you know, the, the, the way that this is generally phrased in English, the versions of the Bible, we who are alive and left. Uh, it's kind of a scary prospect. It almost sounds like, like you know, uh, uh, we, we were an afterthought. <laughs> We are the ones that, that, you know, that kind of fell out of the pocket, <laughs> that had to, had to be retrieved after the fact. No, that's, that's, not, that's not what's being said here at all. Uh, what it's saying is, is that, that we are merely those who are alive. It's not that, that you're left behind. It's not that you are somehow or another on the outs. It's just that you happen to be the ones that are alive. You are the ones that are surviving at this time. Now, when it says surviving to it, there's nothing in the words that are used that are, that are trying to imply that you went through an ordeal and, you know, you were, you know, a big tsunami came and you were hanging on to the, the palm tree for all your worth. Now the water's disappeared and you're, you know, 30 feet up in the palm tree and you don't know how to get down. Good thing that, right, that you're surviving, that someone's coming back for you. Uh, it's, that's not the issue at all. Uh, as well. When we say surviving, we just merely mean those who are alive. So, so what you have here is a dichotomy. Another one of these words I like to use, right? What is a, a dichotomy? A dichotomy is really, uh, it's somewhat helpful at sometimes getting a sense of the, the simpleness of something. But it basically divides everything into two. And so you're looking at everything not in complication and not in all kinds of shapes and patterns, but you're looking at things as either on or off. You're looking at things in the binary, if you will. And so uh, what we have set up here is a, di a dichotomy, and it's, it's basically talking about all those who are in Christ being involved and engaged in this event that's being spoken of, and the dichotomy is, is some of them are dead, and some of them are alive. <laughs> and that's, that's the simplicity of it. And so everybody who is in Christ is associated with this event. But some of them are dead. They've gone before. And at the time that this is occurring, some of us will be alive. Uh, does it, it, it doesn't... It doesn't go any deeper than that, maybe, is what I should say. And why is that, why is that even worth bothering with talking about? Well, it's just this, is that we have a sense, and I think we can blame maybe uh, Tim LaHaye, uh, maybe we can blame Hal Lindsey. You know, when I was younger, Hal Lindsey was to blame, because he's the one who wrote The Late Great Planet Earth. Uh, but, but in our day, Maybe, maybe we can blame Tim LaHaye, because he wrote all of those Left Behind books that became the cheesiest movies ever made. <laughs> uh, but, but all of those things 
What do they have in common? Well, they have in common, I would say even a lot of Baptist teaching has this in common with that, is that somehow or another, there's not this dichotomy that, it, that is being talked about here in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, which really, to tell you the truth, is the place and the only place in the entire New Testament that actually talks about this in clear, spelled out terms. So if you're going to learn anything about the rapture, this is the place to start right here in this text, okay? And what this text tells you is there's people in Christ. Some are dead and some are alive. If they're dead, they're all coming with Christ. If they're alive, they're all going up with Christ. Now, what's, what's the thing there? In Christ, that's, that's the thing that matters. And why do I bring up all of the Hal Lindsey and the Tim LaHaye stuff? <clears throat> is that they have this popular notion, right, that somehow or another there's carnal Christians and there's spiritual Christians and there's these carnal Christians that really aren't living in faith. And because they're not right with the Lord, they get left behind. Right? They get left behind. They weren't ready to go, and they'll get left behind. Then, then they'll realize what happened. After they get left behind, they'll, they'll realize what happened. And they'll say to themselves, I'm such a fool. How could I have let things get out of hand in my faith like this? I better live for Christ now. Right? And then they, they endeavor to do their best to live for Christ now. Ultimately, of course, they're going to be faced with taking the mark or not taking the mark and all of that. And only if they manage to get to that point, place and not take the mark will they actually then go on to, to be with the Lord. Because the Bible says anyone who takes the mark is out. If you take the mark... You are not going to, you are not going to go to heaven. Uh, you're not going into eternity with, with Christ. So anyhow, you know, there's there's all this thought that somehow or another things are not all this clear that the that the alive can maybe be subdivided, subdivided into those who are really ready and those who are less ready. It's not going to happen. By the time we get into the second book of Thessalonians and we get to chapter 2, we'll understand why. Any hints? Anyone go with my hint? Why? Because a, a strong delusion will be sent upon them and they will, and it's all inclusive in that, in that phrase. When we get there, you'll see. They will believe the lie. They, they did not want to believe the truth when they had the opportunity. So when the rapture comes, if they get left behind, there is nothing that's going to pull them back. He who restrains the Spirit of God in the church will be out of the way. Nothing is bringing them back. And a strong delusion is sent upon all of them, and they will believe the lie. The only exception to that that I can find in the Scriptures anywhere is what God is doing with the Jews. Very specifically addressed in the Bible, whether you're looking in the, the book of Daniel or whether you're looking in the Revelation, very specifically addressed. Even, I think, if you look in the Olivet Discourse, you'll, you'll see it there as well. But ultimately, once the church is raptured out of here, which is what this text is talking about, those in Christ at this point in time are, are basically sealed. You have the 144,000 in that wonderful passage that we have in the Revelation. But as far as Gentiles, as far as the church, as far as you know, what we generally consider the evangelical movement, let's say, like the, the, the greater, broader church of Christ, those that are alive when Christ returns, if they're in Christ, they're out of here. All of them. The ones that are doing really well with it and the ones that aren't doing so well. Because sometimes that happens, right? We probably have in our own lives been at places where we believed in Jesus and we were really doing well with it. And then there's times where we still believed in Jesus, but we are struggling. Struggling with something fighting in our souls for, for our our undivided attention to, to Christ, our undivided devotion to Christ. 
We go in and out of these things. Yeah, I mean, isn't that the way of life is? It's like a journey, like in a boat almost, and you're tacking in the wind, the wind of the spirit. Some days you're going forward, and some days you seem like you're not going so so well forward. And that's the truth of virtually everybody who believes. If you are trusting in Christ through all of your struggles, no big deal. You are in Christ, and when the trumpet comes, you're part of the alive in Christ. The problem lies in just that, that whole notion of whether, whether or not you're actually in Christ or not. You know, do you actually trust Christ? Is it making a difference in who you are and where you're going? Is it making some kind of a difference in how you are dealing with life and what you're trying to uh, do uh, amongst other people? It, you know, does Christ make a difference? I mean, there's so many people that sit in churches. What impact has Christ made on their lives? What difference does their faith make? Does it have any impact at all in who they are and what they do and where they're going and how they're developing? I mean, following Jesus is a pretty simple thing. You either believe he's the Messiah and he's worth following, or you're trying to hedge your bets and running on something that's a little less intense. Maybe not the best way to put it. But it's so, it, you know, it just seems so true to me after all these years of, of dealing with Christianity, it just seems so true to me that, that there's just so many people who really don't want to go to hell, but they're not so sure that they want to follow Jesus. I don't blame anyone for not wanting to go to hell, but there's only one way into heaven, and it's following Jesus. It's, it's the only way to get there. He, he knows the way, and you have to be following him to get to the way. He, I mean, it's like he's, he's walking to heaven, and, and they are, all of us have to be following after, after him. And if you're not doing that in your life, if that's not what your belief in Christ is causing to happen to you, then there's issues with that. And then we don't like to be judged, right? We all try not to be judged as Christians and whatnot. But there's times when it's necessary for us to be so. First Corinthians chapter 5, just, just, you know, if you ever had any problem with, with Christians being judgmental of one another. There's a lot of cases, a lot of respects they shouldn't be. But there are cases when they should be. And one of the cases that we should be is if somebody is not demonstrating that they're following Christ in any kind of real way, then it's time to call them on the carpet about that. It's time to ask them, does, it, does Jesus make a difference in your life? Does it matter to you? Why are you making the choices that you're making? Why are you pursuing the goals that you're pursuing? Why are you doing the things that you're doing? Why do you treat people the way you treat them? You know, sometimes, sometimes we just need to, to call someone on the carpet and say, you know, if you keep on doing this, that's nothing but a denial of Christ the Lord. You need, to, you need not to do that. You need to change what's going on in is that an appropriate thing for a Christian to do? Yes, it is. It, it absolutely is a, an appropriate thing to do. And it's one of the things we need to do for each other, just not because we're trying to stick our nose in each other's business or not because we're trying to make ourselves feel better by putting someone else down or any of those other kind of crazy things that people do, but just because when it comes to being ready, it's not how you started it. It's not even how you did in the middle. It's how you're doing now. It's how you're doing at the end. That matters. Right now is the end of my life. I mean, when you think about it, right? I mean, could my life end right now? It could. But at the same point in time, of all that I lived is life, this is the end. Right now. In this moment, this is the end. If it's the end of my life, I want it to be.
following Jesus. And sometimes we just got to get our heads wrapped about around what it means to actually live in faith. And what living in faith means is in that present moment, that, that every moment that goes by is that moment basically moving through time. That's one way to look at it anyhow. In that moment that's called now, that's the time that we don't want to be doubtful about this. That's the time that we don't want to be uncertain about this. That's the time that we don't want to be messing around with this. That's the time that we want to know, yes, right now, I love Jesus. I want to follow him. That's who I am. That's where I'm going. That's what I'm doing. The surefire answer to get you there. And you don't have to worry about, you know, not being included in the in those that are surviving and remaining. You know, you, you don't have to you don't have to be concerned about what's going to happen when the trumpet sounds. You have a certain expectation about that first big step. That's going to be a big one, right? Because if you're walking one day and the trumpet sounds, this step will be normal, and this one is going to be a big one. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> you're going to go from ground level to up in the clouds, no time flat. That's going to be awesomely cool. And it's something you look forward to if your heart is for Christ. That's a better way to live than living full of yourself and full of doubt.